Good day. How is everybody? We have finished for the time being our look through Ramsey's book on Christian ethics. And let me just remind you a little bit about what we were doing there. Ramsey's book is probably a pretty complex book for undergraduates, but on the other hand, um, I kind of feel like that uh, it might have been a challenge to you that you could uh, work through and at least get the main points of what we were trying to get at. In my courses, uh, the classes, the lectures, and the discussions, and the uh, reading material are kind of uh, parallel universes. In other words, uh, you're not necessarily, obviously, as you noticed, you're not necessarily tested in a kind of a detailed thing on concepts and and uh, and dates and names and so forth. The main idea is to try to get the message of what uh, what our subject matter involves and uh, how it how it has evolved historically. In other words, it's more of a history of thought and history of ideas than it is just a history. That means that a great deal of what I say will be uh, probably uh, pretty passionate in terms of trying to explicate some ideas that, from my perspective, have been entirely, entirely missed by whole generations of people. And uh, in that sense, it might sound like I'm trying to convert somebody to something, but I want to assure you that what I'm trying to do is to uh, do... Uh, religious studies in a way which uh, I think is the best way to do it, and that is if you take a course on Jewish ethics, I would prefer to take it under someone who uh, is an insider on Jewish ethics and can actually explicate it in a way that would that will help me understand it because quite often in these kind of comparative religion courses or even sociology of religion or the history of religion um, Things are discussed only in terms of practice, you know, of overt practices and rituals and things like that, which really doesn't get down to the heart of anybody's religion. And it's, it, that's especially true. I can't do that with ancient religions. I can only try to approximate some kind of psychological understanding of an ancient religion. But there are lots of religions that are still living religions. In other words, they're not dead bodies that you're kind of dissecting. They are living religions in which you're trying to, you're trying to get out uh, some understanding of how people who are really living and involved in these religions think about various things. That means that all our discussion, our discussion will be very complex and complicated because there is a wide spectrum of ethical and theological belief within Christianity by itself. So in a sense, we're going to have to focus on some things from one, per, one or a you know, few persons' perspectives and then try to look at other perspectives in the light of those. Because if you don't understand one perspective very well, then you're not going to understand much about many perspectives. When I first came to Houston to do my doctorate at Rice, for instance, uh, one of the requirements for staying in the program was that at the end of six months, uh, you are at the end of nine months, you had to take what was called the great man exam. And what you were supposed to do was to pick out a, a well-known great theologian or religious thinker or philosopher and learn him. Learn him so well that you could sit, kind of sit in a chair and have six or seven people question you as if you were him so that the answers you gave were not uh, answers that you uh, just kind of superficially picked up, but were actually answers that gave people a, a, a real understanding of the guy that you were talking about. I chose Paul Tillich. And the reason why I chose Paul Tillich is because he was the theologian at the time that was probably the most opposite from me. And that was one of the best... Uh, experiences I ever had, because after studying Paul Tillich well enough to pass an exam in front of Tillich experts, uh, I was, it was much easier for me then to turn around and understand some theologians which were actually closer to my position, like Karl Barth and uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and people like that. 
And so that was one of the big steps forward in my education. And that's, that's the way I try to promote religious studies. That is, you need to learn one religion and one ethic very well so that you'll have kind of a, so that you'll kind of be swimming inside a religious thought form and therefore you can understand other people better. Uh, not just in contrast, but the similarities. Now we're turning today to a book by a man named Michael Banner, and uh, if uh, if we can get a there we are, if we can get a look at this book cover, Christian Ethics in Contemporary Moral Problems by Michael Banner. Now let me tell you about this book, how it's different from the book that we've just read uh, by Ramsey. First of all, this is a very recent book in the late 90s. And it's written by a much younger man, a man who was not old enough to study under Paul Ramsey. But he's a man who studied ethics uh, at Cambridge University. And he is now the F.D. Maurice Professor of Moral and Social Theology in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College, London. Now, F.D. Maurice is a uh, great, kind of moderate, liberal, Anglican theologian ethicist of the 19th century. And uh, uh, so he's held in high regard by people who have done much in-depth study of either preaching or, or ethics or theology. But you'll also notice that English universities, British universities, and European universities have no problem in having the word theology in their department name. Now we have a problem with that in the United States because of a peculiar uh, uh, invention that we have in the United States, which is called, which is sometimes called the separation of church and state. But actually, the invention was uh, the first First Amendment. That is, Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion, or, for that matter, make uh, Congress can't make any laws interfering with the practice of religion with the free exercise of religion. And uh, that's one of the most important things about American law that uh, very few other countries have. Even if they've dissed the church, even if they've cut the church off from culture and from uh, other kinds of things, they haven't had the same experience that America has in terms of the so-called separation between church and state. Um, but this has been one of the most important and positive experiences America's had. For one thing, uh, it has protected the government from any particular religious perspective having hegemony. It has also protected all religious perspectives from, from the hegemony of any government. So for that reason, religion has flourished in America where there's separation of church and state. Uh, where it has, it has not flourished at all in some countries where there is no separation of church and state. Where, for instance, people still sometimes pay taxes to, uh, to support religion and where, for instance, the king and the queen, or the queen has to be a member of a certain religion and so forth. That was supposedly for the purpose of preserving and protecting religion. It actually historically had the opposite effect. And what really preserved and protected the freedom of religion was the... Uh, kind of thing that we have in our First Amendment. Unfortunately, this concept is under attack from various sides lately. Uh, people on the far left don't really like the idea of the protection of the free exercise of religion. Sometimes people on the far right do not like the idea of, of making sure we, we keep from es establishing any kind of religion. And uh, so the irony is that some people on the Christian right who were actually the instigators or the, or the uh, inaugurators of the idea of freedom of religion and separation of church and state are sometimes today um, found on the side of, uh, of, not, of trying not to keep this uh, barrier in place. So anytime you establish a religious studies program uh, in a state university, you have to keep in mind uh, that the state university has no right to, to proselyte someone to any one particular religion. 
But religious studies in state universities recently have gotten to the point where that you not only cannot proselyte, which is a good thing, sometimes you can't even adequately explicate something because that might sound too much like uh, proselyting or apologetics and so forth. And so uh, I would simply say that in the exercise of uh, my academic freedom, and I hope the academic freedom of the people who teach for me, such as Jewish scholars and Muslim scholars and so forth, that uh, they are understood to have the freedom to explicate the, the viewpoints with which they're familiar. Um, as well as they can, and also to cl clear up any misunderstandings historically and culturally about their viewpoints. For instance, a Muslim teacher uh, has the right to point out that most American uh, thought, popular American thought, and sometimes even academic American thought, about the relationship of Islam to women or the relationship of Islam to to jihad or to some other idea from Islam is almost always misunderstood. It's not completely misunderstood, but it's almost always misunderstood to a certain extent, and so people need to understand uh, that in order to be able to, to uh, get along with people and to understand them. In other words, the more you can understand Islam, the better you'll be able to understand your own faith and how your own faith relates to that. So we can't do that in the United States under the heading of theology. But you'll notice that Banner uses the word dogmatics. And dogma, as we said last time, has become a dirty word. Because under the modernist paradigm, all truth is one, and it is naturalistic and rationalistic. Well, of course, what does that do? That, that uh, relegates all revelational, enlightenment, uh, intuitive ethics, and religious thought to the peripheries of society, and it should have no, you know, shouldn't have anything basically to do with the society, which is an impossibility. You can separate the church from state, but you cannot separate religion from culture. And you certainly can't separate religion from the people who live in the state. And so uh, it's important to know our own religious background as well as the religious backgrounds of others. And part of religious background in religion like Christianity is to understand its theology. Otherwise you have no idea why people are doing things. You can go to a Christian church and you can watch people, you know, get up and down and eat things and do things, but you don't have any idea what they're doing unless you understand a little bit about their theology. Another point I want to make is that I mentioned the modernist paradigm. Uh, the modernist paradigm is not the same thing as being liberal. Uh, American political thought and American democracy generally has been overwhelmingly liberal, and that includes liberal, uh, the word liberal there includes not only Democrats and socialists, but, but it includes even people that we consider to be on the uh, conservative wing of American politics. Most of these people are liberals in the sense of a small l. But there's a kind of a liberalism and a kind of a modernism that is basically uh, uh, is basically built on a on a conscious rejection of traditional Christian thought, tradi tr uh, traditional Christian dogmatics, and traditional Christian ethics. And so, in this perspective, since there's only one truth, and science is the one that pre that presents us with that truth then from this perspective, religion can only be studied as a sociology subject or as a psychology subject or some other kind of subject. And, uh, and, and that is very important. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the best uh, sociology of religion teachers in the country at this school. Uh, so that's extremely important. But it's also important to get inside the uh, heads and the hearts of religious people to maybe a little bit more better understand what they're doing. We're now living in what some people call a post-modernist age. Now, post-modernism means different things to different people. Post-modernism 
arose as a kind of an acid, a kind of an intellectual acid to kind of uh, eat away at the modernist paradigm, that is, at, at the naturalistic, uh, uh, rationalistic paradigm that we've been living in for a long time. But it had, a, it had an auxiliary effect, or a collateral effect. <laughs> Some people might even call it collateral damage. And that is that it also set the stage for allowing even dogmatics in the sense of, uh, uh, not in the sense of dogmatic in the bad sense, but dogmatic in the sense of an affirmative belief that is derived from either a concept of revelation or, or some concept of, uh, uh, of an older paradigm, of uh, an older worldview, an older concept of what human beings are and if there is a God and what's the relationship of human beings to God. It has allowed for freedom of these kinds of viewpoints now to kind of come in their own and if they have any uh, intellectual integrity to be able to uh, be able to, to put forth their intellectual integrity. And so in that sense postmodernism is a boon to uh, uh, to some worldviews, particularly religious and, uh, and other kinds of worldviews, which were just kind of considered off base by a modernist academic paradigm. And so these days we have all kinds of people putting forth their views or their perspectives. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Some of these views uh, I react very negatively against, but in the light of the First Amendment, I think it's a great thing that these views are able to put them put themselves forward in public, where there can be, you know, this was kind of John Milton's view of the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion is that uh, that people be able to put forth their views in public, and this is also John Madison's view, and then they would be able to clash without the state interfering, including ac the academic wing of the state interfering, but uh, actually allowing people to, to express their views. And, um, and I think that's a good thing. So as we look at Banner, we will notice that he probably tends to be more conservative uh, in his appreciation of traditional Christian ethical stances. For instance, there's a chapter here on abortion. And this chapter on abortion is very politically incorrect in terms of American uh, social thought. Uh, but what I want you to do is to, think, is to read and think carefully about this because uh, Christians, to a great extent, have contributed heavily to modern, democratic, liberal social thought. But at the same time, Christians should not necessarily be required to submit themselves to a consensus, liberal, or democratic, or American view of any particular moral issue. You understand what I'm saying? And sometimes, sometimes political correctness of various kinds kind of push people in that direction. And so a lot of people are under the impression that any humane intelligent, rational person will have the same view of abortion as the, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, uh, National Organization for Women. <laughs> and that's not, just not true. And uh, there are a lot of people that are not even religious who don't have that exact understanding. There are a lot of people, in fact, who are uh, there are some philosophers who are atheistic who do not have that view of abortion. And there are certainly uh, people who are Christians and even liberal Christians who do not have a view of abortion, for instance, that corresponds to uh, what we generally call abortion on demand. So if abortion on demand, even if it's the law of the United States, does not necessarily bind Christians or Jews or Muslims or even atheists within uh, the law within that land does not bind them from trying to assert their particular understanding of the nature of human beings. 
In other words, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, cannot make the decision for people, religious or non-religious, as, as to when human life begins. They can make a decision to kind of mediate the, the conflicting interest in an American society, but they can't make that decision. They can't uh, make the decision about whether an immortal soul exists. I've already told you that I think that's a non-Christian idea, but the Supreme Court can't tell me that. That has to come from, from some other kind of understanding. So the Supreme Court cannot tell me at what stage in the life of an infant or an embryo uh, it, um, is, uh, it, it, it's of human value. And so people should be able to continue to debate this question, not for the purpose of uh, passing laws uh, against uh, either majorities or minorities, forcing your opinion on people. But on the other hand, that does not mean that Christians or Jews or Muslims should simply say, well, since we're Americans, we have to have the same opinion. We don't. We can still talk about uh, life and, uh, and uh, choice and uh, pro-life and pro-choice and uh, other kinds of things. We can talk about consistent pro-choice or consistent pro-life or inconsistent pro-choice, inconsistent pro-life, and we can, uh, we can talk about these things. And that's what uh, Michael Banner does in this book. But let's look at the first chapter, which uh, is entitled turning the world upside down, and some other tasks for dogmatic Christian ethics. By, by dogmatic Christian ethics, he just means that Christian ethics and theology cannot be successfully separated. Uh, philosophical ethics can be successfully separated from Christian theology. Muslim ethics can be successfully separated from Christian theology. But Muslim ethics cannot be se successfully separated from Muslim theology. And Christian ethics cannot be se successfully, successfully separated from Christian theology. So we just have to see what is, the, what is the relationship between the Christian message and what Christians say about Christian ethics. And uh, this expression, turning the world upside down, comes from the New Testament because somebody made the point about the early Christians that they were turning the world upside down. And that is a very apt expression of what happened to the world, to the Roman world with the entrance of Christianity. Now, in the first part of this chapter, he, uh, Banner quotes Karl Barth, and I've mentioned Karl Barth uh, a couple of times. Karl Barth was a Swiss theologian who did a great deal of work in Germany uh, just before and dur uh, just before and during the uh, Nazi uh, takeover in Germany. And he was an anti-Nazi, and for his anti-Nazi work, he was uh, given the privilege of leaving Germany. But uh, he was also one of the instigators of what is called the Confessing Church of Germany. That was the part of the church which refused to allow Hitler to determine its theology and ethics. Hitler, you know, wanted to make the German church into a Nazi, a wing of the Nazi party. If not a wing of the Nazi party, at least a co-conspirator or a, a, a collaborator. And to a certain extent, he was successful. And some of the most famous German theologians sometimes taught wearing Nazi armbands. And those people... Uh, were not in very good standing with the German church after World War II because uh, instead of standing up to Nazism, they kind of folded and assumed that maybe this was what God was doing in the world. You know, that was one of the, that was one of the ideas of liberal Protestantism, that if we have to look at the world and we have to see what God is doing in the world. Well, what God was obviously doing in the world in Germany in the 1930s was putting Adolf Hitler into power. And so if you have such a fluid or uh, un undogmatic or unprecise view of what Christianity should be, then a lot of Christians actually adopted Hitler. 
and adopted some of his, uh, a lot of people who call themselves Christians at least, uh, adopted Hitler, or at least do adopted some of his ideas, particularly his pers per, uh, in perspective as to how Jews should be treated. And, uh, but the confessing church was the part of the German church that absolutely refused to give in to these kinds of things. And so uh, some of them uh, paid the ultimate pen penalty. Some of, m many of them had to leave Germany, but those that stayed, some of them were hung, hanged in the uh, concentration camps and so forth. So Karl Barth was one of the great anti-Nazi Protestant theologians. He was a reformed theologian. He was also considered to be, he was called neo-Orthodox. Now he didn't call himself neo-Orthodox, but he was a critic of static orthodoxy. He was a critic of dogmatic orthodoxy. But he was also a critic of dogmatic liberalism because he believed that liberalism had gutted Christian theology. For instance, gotten rid of its doctrine of sin and judgment that we talked about before. And so Karl Barth was kind of the instigator also of what is called neo-orthodoxy in Protestant theology. And as such, he influenced a great deal of Protestant theology, including people like Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Ramsey and other people that we have already talked about. And what happened was he, he made them kind of neo-orthodox. They don't like to be called neo-orthodox, and so... Uh, uh, that's just a kind of a category that might be helpful because if you have if you think of Christianity as being orthodox modernist or liberal then what is in between <laughs> what is in between maybe a neo-orthodoxy or a modern orthodoxy or a new orthodoxy that takes into account both uh, modern science modern psychology modern everything else but also seeks to maintain the basic principal elements of the Christian faith. Neo-orthodoxy was different from fundamentalism because fundamentalism was an, was a, um, was an extreme uh, orthodox reaction to modernism and liberalism and to science and to modern ideas. Neo-orthodoxy attempted to take into consideration all of the truths of science and of modern life and of the Enlightenment while at the same time maintaining that there were certain things about the Christian faith that you couldn't scuttle without losing the essence or the basics of, basis of the Christian faith. So a lot of younger people like Banner are picking up on Bard again and are actually talking about Bard as if he were the first post-modernist Christian theologian. So instead of being called neo-orthodox now, a lot of younger theologians call him postmodernist. That is, we can now assert, according to these younger guys, we can now assert the basics of the, of the Orthodox Christian faith without being orthodox in the old sense, and also without being modernist or liberal in the 19th and early 20th century sense. And that, from their perspective, is the most powerful form of the explication of Christianity available in the world today. And so Michael Banner kind of falls under that category. And uh, in a sense, uh, this kind of thing, this kind of movement is pretty necessary. If you study it sociologically and psychologically, it's pretty necessary for Christianity to continue as a vital force in the future because the very nature of liberalism and modernist Christianity is that it's basically dying. Just like modernism in, in, in academia, uh, to a certain extent, is dying. Uh, and naturalism, and ac complete naturalism in academia is kind of losing its edge. But in the same way, liberalism and modernist Christianity is kind of dying. This is a sociological fact. This is a statistical fact. If you look at the, at the denominations that basically absorbed modernism and liberalism, they are now losing members at a steady, steady rate. The only people who are gaining members are the descendants of the old fundamentalists, such as the people who call themselves evangelicals and the people who call themselves uh, charismatics. And many of these people are picking up on Karl Barth again, you know. So if, you, if you've been dead long enough, people will re rediscover you again. And, uh, 
And so for a long time, for decades, in theological s centers and in uh, and the American Academy of Religion and other places, wherever Karl Barth's name was mentioned, it was mentioned as if he were some kind of an idiot uh, by people who had never even read Karl Barth and knew nothing about his importance. That doesn't mean that any modern ethicist or theologian is simply a Bardian, because you can't simply be a Bardian, and Bart certainly doesn't want anybody to be a Bardian. He didn't believe in Bardian theology or neo-orthodox theology. What he was trying to do was explicate biblical theology. And he thought that's what people should be doing. But he did it in such a way that some of his insights are very powerful as we move into an age of postmodernism, where where Christians and Christian ethics do not just kind of have to lay down and play dead in the face of modernity. That is, that Christians can actually participate in modernity and yet bring along with them the vitality of their Christian faith. Anyway, this is Karl Barth. And you haven't learned all there is to know about Karl Barth. But, and he's very difficult to read. So I don't recommend him to be read to, uh, uh, to an undergraduate until they've gotten a great deal more understanding. But Karl Barth talked about the entrance of Christianity into human life. And he likened it to the Mozart opera Don Giovanni. Have any of you ever seen Don Giovanni? Good. Uh, Don Giovanni is one of those... Uh, uh, Mozart was Karl Barth's favorite theologian. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think of Mozart as kind of a secular musical composer. In fact, there was a there was a Christ, there was a, a, a Houston Chronicle article a couple of years ago in which somebody was interviewing a contemporary Christian singer, which was fine. Except right down in the middle of the article, the 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 interviewer said something like, "Ask the Christian contemporary music person. It's unusual, isn't it, for music to have any particular theological content?" which is, of course, absolutely absurd. It's only recently that music didn't have, that any music developed uh, that didn't have some uh, theological content, particularly uh, classical or serious music. And uh, though Mozart was not Handel uh, uh, or even Bach in the sense of being overtly theological, Karl Barth considers him to be the greatest musician because his music he considered to be almost a revelation from God. His music, not necessarily his lyrics, but his music to kind of be a revelation from God. The highest form of God's uh, gifting of human beings. In fact, that's kind of the basis of that movie that came out a few years ago, uh, Amadeus, because the, um, the word uh, Amadeus... Uh, Amadeus uh, was uh, Mozart's name, and it also refers to a kind of a theological idea of being the gift of God. Uh, and uh, uh, and so Mozart is is probably a lot of people think maybe Han Handel or Bach are the favorite uh, mu music of theologians, but it's been my experience that Mozart probably is. But Mozart's uh, play, Don Giovanni, is a good thing to use in any theology or ethics course for two or three reasons. For one reason, it deals with, uh, with uh, the psychology and the theology and the ethics of sexuality and of human, uh, of human sinfulness. And the time, one of the times that I went to see Don Giovanni down here in Houston, everybody laughed, or not everybody, but a great many people laughed at the places where Mozart would have expected them not to laugh. Now let me explain that. Don Juan has come to mean what in modern society? Particularly in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, Don Juan came almost, became almost the folk hero, you know. Uh, you you want to be a Don Juan if you're a man. Uh, 
this was this was a kind of uh, of our American macho phase that everybody wanted to be a Don Juan. Why? Because Don Juan had his pick of women. He had his way with any woman he wanted. Well, so when people, when some people went to see Don Giovanni, uh, they kind of perceived it as a comedy, and it is kind of comical in some ways. But some of the places that they laughed at were not supposed to be comical, or they were supposed to be serious comedy. <laughs> For instance, when, when Don Juan's uh, attaché uh, tries, to, tries to warn one of Don Juan's uh, targets, a woman, that Don Juan is a sick man, he can't establish a meaningful relationship to any woman, and so even though he's a highly uh, charismatic and attractive and macho person, uh, who will be attractive to uh, superficially to a great many women, you should not be taken in by it because he will hurt you, he will destroy you spiritually. And then the uh, Don Juan's uh, servant goes on to talk about all of the women Don Juan has and everybody just falls out laughing. <laughs> you know how funny it is Don Juan has had all these women. And what the servant is trying to say is that that's not something to laugh about. That is something to be sad about because it shows that he's a sick person. So Don Giovanni is a good play to, uh, for an ethics class to go see in terms of sexual ethics and, uh, and in terms of the concept of sin because that's what Don Giovanni represents in all of his uh, incarnations as a sick person who is uh, not able to establish a meaningful relationship with women and therefore a tragic character. And he makes, his, he makes the lives of all the women he comes into contact with tragedies. But Bart chooses the, one of the, final, the final scene in Don Giovanni as an analogy for the entrance of Christianity into the world. And that's the scene in which the commendadore, Commendatore, who is the commander, uh, just kind of breaks open the stage and enters the scene and sings this huge uh, solo, which is frightening. And most uh, psychological analysis of Don Giovanni think that the Commendatore represents Mozart's father, who Mozart had a bad relationship with and always afraid of him and so forth. But Karl Barth uses this as an example of what happened when Christ came into the world. It just broke open the stage and it's so abrupt nobody can expect it. It's not exactly a, 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 an offstage God who comes onto the stage to save everything. It is a totally unexpected intrusion in which judgment and uh, judgment comes to uh, Don Giovanni. Well, the difference is, of course, uh, Don Giovanni is hauled down to hell by the devil. But in a sense, uh, the story of Don Giovanni is just totally uh, interrupted by the appearance of this, of this man. And what Bard is saying is that's the same thing that happened to the world. The story of the world was just, was just almost violently interrupted by the introduction of Jesus, of Christianity into the world. Bart wanted to stress with his imagery a theme which lay close to his heart from the beginning of his revolutionary commentary on the Epistle to Romans to the final pages of his monumental church dogmatics. It is that... The word of God, Jesus Christ, comes upon history as it is humanly conceived, as an abrupt and unanticipated word, giving to this history an ending which could not be anticipated or expected, humanly speaking. That's the reason why it is no, it's not, it's not Christian theologians do not consider it to be a bad rap to be said to be not a rational ethic or not a rational theology because Christianity is not based on reason. 
It is based on the entrance into history from outside of God. In other words, it's based on revelation. It's based on the uh, incarnation. If, the, if revelation and incarnation, if God's attempt, according to Judaism and Christianity, if God had never attempted to get into contact with man, then the history of the world would just roll on like it always does without any interference. But the word of God in, the, in Jesus Christ, according to Christian theology, is the breaking into history. It's, it's, kind of lot, it's kind of like knocking the stage over, but bursting the stage open in order that our lives not continue in this tra tragic, meaningless way, but that somehow or another judgment and maybe even redemption, there's not much redemption in Don Giovanni, but uh, uh, there is redemption in the uh, story of Jesus. Uh, and redemption comes after judgment, comes after confrontation. So in that sense, uh, Don Giovanni perhaps is not a fully Christian view of the world, but it, it, it has all of the elements a Christian view of the world will have up to a certain point. That is, it, it, will, it will describe our lives in terms of tragedy, in terms of meaningless, until there is some outside judgment or outside redemption. So, no inference or induction, be it grounded in philosophy or psychology in the natural sciences or in the history or in historical knowledge could lead us to anticipate this conclusion to the story of human life. Now Christians uh, are, under, are aware that they can't prove this scientifically. That, that would be exactly contradiction to that statement. Science cannot anticipate this. Uh, historical analysis cannot anticipate this. So if we look again at our, at our screen, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, comes upon history as it is humanly conceived, that is, as history is humanly conceived, as an abrupt and unanticipated word giving this history an ending which could not be anticipated or expected, humanly speaking. If you're going to look for a paradigm for the meaning of history, would you, would you look at the crucifixion of Jesus as a paradigm for the meaning of history? Well, think about that. Crucifixion of Jesus, what is it? H.L. Uh, Mencken one time said something that's, that's absolutely absurd from the perspective of history, from the perspective of psychology, from the perspective of uh, even English uh, literature. He said, the story of Jesus is a beautiful story, a lovely story. The problem with it is that it's just not true because it is poetry. And notice this statement. The essence of poetry is that it is not true. Well, I hope your English professor <laughs> could uh, do a little better with poetry than that. That is not the essence of poetry, that it's not true. But H.L. Mencken did understand that the story of Jesus had a kind of paradigmatic character. That is that if it were true that Jesus was raised from the dead, then that would change it all. That would change everything. He just didn't believe it was true, so it didn't change anything. But the point I'm making is that if, if Mencken is correct, and the resurrection is not true, but the crucifixion is, that also says something about the nature of the world. And the cruci crucifixion of Jesus, without the concept of resurrection and redemption, makes the world a pretty horrible place to contemplate. Because what happened at the crucifixion of Jesus? A skinny Jew was nailed to a piece of wood, and he was stuck into the ground, and he was left to die, to suffocate. If that is a paradigm for, for the world, which, which some atheistic existentialist would say is a pretty good paradigm for the world, for instance, um, um, in Waiting for Godot, the paradigm for the world is a pregnant woman straddled a grave. She's a pregnant woman, she's straddling a grave, and she's giving birth. And what happens to the child as soon as it pops out? It lands in the grave so you can throw dirt over it. That's a pretty 
<laughs> that's a pretty tragic paradigm of human life. And without the resurrection and the idea of redemption, th that's the kind of paradigm the crucifixion of Jesus would be. It wouldn't be a very hopeful thing. And so what uh, Bard is saying is that, that when Jesus is crucified, uh, if you just look at it as the crucifixion of one individual, there were already hundreds of people crucified in Israel during the time lifetime of Jesus. You could see them crucified all up and down the roads. And so you, if you walk by one of these crucifixions, you wouldn't say, oh, look there, there's the hope of the world. You would say, look at the world. That's the way the world is. I better keep myself from being in that situation. Uh, but if that, if that gives us an indication of the meaning of life and the meaning of the world, it's a pretty horrible thing. And so that's the reason from the perspective of the early Christians. The crucifixion had no religious meaning unless there was also a resurrection. Had no religious meaning unless there was also a resurrection. But if there is a resurrection, then it has a profound religious meaning. One of the things it means is that is that human beings who think, have thought since the beginning of time, evidently, that the way to get on God's side is to offer blood sacrifice. Especially blood sacrifice of your children. There was a uh, movie that I saw last night that was put out, I don't know, I guess 15 or 20 years ago now, called The Believer's which was about a, uh, a religion which exists in America uh, in which some of its most extreme adherents practice uh, uh, human sacrifice. And, uh, and that was a kind of a blood-curdling uh, blood movie because the whole point of this religion was if we offer our own firstborn children in sacrifice to God, then we can live lives of success and poverty, of prosperity and so forth. Well, that's basically the pagan paradigm. The gods are not really very good beings. They just soon step on you as look at you. But if you can get on their side in some way by feeding them what they like to eat, namely the blood of your children, uh, then they will give you all the good things. They will protect you. That's black magic. And that's the theological basis of, uh, of polytheism and of paganism. And so basically one of the things that the sacrifice of Jesus is saying is that has been turned upside down. But that's only if you believe that Jesus was the incarnation of God. If you don't believe in Jesus is the incarnation of God, then the cru crucifixion of Jesus was another human sacrifice. If you believe in the Incarnation, then the crucifixion was not a human sacrifice. It's the turning upside down of human sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of whom? It's God sacrificing himself. Now that, you know, you can believe that or not believe it, but that's basically the Christian understanding of what the sacrifice of Christ is. It's not an ancient blood ritual, as a great deal of modernists uh, think it is. In fact, a lot of modernist Christians have have uh, gotten all, gotten the word blood out of all of their hymns and all of their hymn books because it's, a, it's an embarrassment to them in the modern world to think that Christianity has something to say about blood sacrifice. Well, the whole point is that's a misunderstanding of what Christianity says about blood sacrifice. What Christianity is saying about blood sacrifice is that blood sacrifice, the sacrifice of animals and human beings, cannot budge a sin. It cannot do anything to produce salvation. It cannot produce anything having to do with redemption. The only sacrifice that can bring about redemption is God's self-sacrifice of himself. So the self-sacrifice of God, then, is capped by the resurrection. In other words, as a paradigm for meaning of history, the crucifixion cannot stand by itself. If it stands by itself, then it is a tragic symbol. It's a tragic paradigm. If it is coupled with some idea of resurrection, however you conceive of that, then the, sac the, uh, the uh, sacrifice of Christ is understood not as human beings doing something drastic in order to get in, 
into a relationship with God, like sacrifice represents. But it represents God doing something drastic to get in relationship with human beings because human beings can't get in proper relationship. The fact that they offer their children as sacrifices show just how far human beings are from understanding God and from trying to get in relationship with him. So God has to do the acting. He has to do the sacrifice. So in Christianity, there, there are no more animal sacrifices. There are no human sacrifices uh, because the sacrifice has already been made. It's been made by God. That does not mean, as, uh, as it would in paganism, that the literal uh, dripping blood of Jesus has some magical power. What that means is that the blood of Jesus shed on the cross has the, has the, symbolizes the power of God's love in actually taking upon, taking upon himself the estrangement between human beings and God. And so that's the reason why it is still quite appropriate for, for modern Christians to practice baptism, which is a blood ritual. It's a ritual that symbolizes the, the burial, the death and the burial and the resurrection of, of human beings. And the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, which is a ritual that symbolizes the taking into oneself the body and the blood of Jesus. Um, but you can only take that and have, have that as a meaning if you believe that Jesus was not just another human sacrifice. You can only take that and it can only have meaning if you understand that this is the sacrifice of God. So that Christians do not come to church on Sunday morning to offer a sacrifice. Christians come to church on Sunday morning to receive the gifts that have been all already offered. So, that is a pretty abrupt entering into history. And that's what Karl Barth is saying. And that's what Banner is saying. That's a pretty abrupt entering into history. Uh, that, that, that goes against all common sense, all reasonable expectations. It's totally unanticipated. It may be false, but it's totally unanticipated. And the difference between Christians and non-Christians is that Christians believe that even though it is totally unanticipated, it's not based on uh, religion, it's not based on reason, it's based on revelation and the action of God. That's what makes them Christians. So it's kind of, it's kind of useless to go around saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the... In the uh, cross of the resurrection of Christ. Well, that's wonderful, but why are you a Christian? <laughs> that's, that's what makes the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Jews are wonderful people, but they don't want to be called Christians. And uh, Christians should not necessarily want to be called Christians if, if they believe the same thing about the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ as Jews do. Because most Christian theologians understand that if they did not believe in the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus as Messiah, then they would probably ra rather be Jews. Because the Judaism, Judaism is the religion of Jesus. Judaism is the religion of revelation. So if there's revelation without the death and resurrection of Christ, then most Christians would, would want to go there. They don't go there because they believe in the resurrection of Christ. Does that make sense? So it's, it, 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 is, it, it is, Christianity is not something that's required by scientific knowledge or rational knowledge. It's something that's required if you accept the paradigm of the res, death and resurrection of Christ as giving the meaning, meaning to human existence and human history and human life. And uh, what, uh, what a Christian is doing is participating in that. That's symbolized by baptism. It's symbolized by the Lord's Supper. It's symbolized by the uh, Christian expectation of the resurrection and so forth. So if it, it, if it is anticipated, is in a, it is anticipated only pro prophetically, which is to say that it is 
anticipated as unanticipatable. Uh, these Bardians like to use that kind of language. <laughs> it's anticipated as unanticipatable. So when someone comes along, either in terms of uh, a philosophical analysis of Christianity and says, there's nothing rational about this. You can't arrive at this conclusion based on rational premises. The Christian shouldn't turn around and say, oh, oh, no, you're wrong. This is very rationally anticipated. This is very uh, scientific or this is very, uh, very well based in reason because that is not Christianity. Christianity is unanticipatable by science or by philosophy or by reason. That doesn't make it true, but it's unanticipatable. As by the prophet Isaiah, when he declares, Thus says the Lord, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Back to Don Giovanni, all these people are set, sitting out on the stage and they're whining about their lives and about misery and so forth. And uh, they're not anticipating uh, the commendatori breaking down the stage and coming out and, and settling the issue and ending the play. Uh, that's, that's the last thing they anticipate. And so what, what Christian theology, what the Christian story says is that, that uh, if you want to study about why, what Christians believe about Jesus, you have to understand that, that it's a totally unanticipated uh, event, which either makes sense of history or it doesn't. If it doesn't make sense of history, then you're going to have to find something else. But if it does make sense of history, then you can't put it alongside of every other uh, attempt to make sense of history. You can only accept one basic attempt to understand history. The new thing which God intends and accomplishes is not to be understood, that is to say, without qualification, as a sweeping away of the old, but as a renewal, as a recreation. Christianity is a, is, comes from the Jewish faith, which believes in the goodness of creation. So when, when, when God comes from outside of creation into creation, it's not to destroy creation, like maybe happens in Don Giovanni. It is to redeem creation. Specifically, God's new deed is not finally directed at human condemnation, but a human liberation. And in the very particular sense that God's action seeks to evoke and evince a newness in the life and action of those who are its object. If it anticipated, uh, well, let's see, I did that. There is, so Bart claimed, a form of life, a turning the world upside down, which is an expression, as I said, comes from the New Testament, where a non-believer accuses Christians of turning the world upside down, and he in a sense, is making a prophetic statement because that's exactly what Christianity is supposed to do. Which corresponds to and is established by the action of God. This correspondence of divine and human action is neatly expressed in a formula which was consistently to govern his thought on these matters, that is, Bart. Dogmatics itself is ethics. Now, to put that in more modern terms, which Banner doesn't necessarily want to do, but to put it in more modern terms, theology and ethics are the same thing. You can't separate theology and ethics in Christianity. If you want to know what to do, you have to know what God has done. And ethics is also dogmatics. So Bard asserts at one and the same time the essentially ethical significance of the subject matter of dogmatics and the essentially dogmatic character of the presuppositions of genuine ethics. He asserts, that is to say, that an account of the action of God is an account of an action to which certain human action properly and necessarily corresponds. That's what we were talking about, faith and love. God loves us. We respond to that in faith and thanksgiving. And we respond to that also by loving other people. Otherwise, we don't know what love means. Conversely, an account of good human action properly and necessarily makes reference to the action of God by which it is both evoked 
and warned. There's nothing that a Christian ethicist can do about that. If he talks about ethics, he's going to talk about what God has done. So according to this way of thinking, the task of Christian ethics lies in the description of human action called forth by the reality of the action of God to which dogmatics bears witness. So at least when you're reading Banner, you can see that Paul Ramsey is not all by himself, that he represents a broad group of Christian theologians and ethicists as to the basic meaning of ethics. If they got together, now Ramsey, I said, is old, is, is, uh, Banner is not even young, old enough to have been taught by Ramsey. But if, uh, if they had gotten together and, had, and got into a seminar, they, would, they could have all kinds of disagreements, as Christian ethicists do all the time. But there would not be disagreement on the basic story. The basic story is where you begin. And it's out of the basic story that you try to figure out how you act in every situation, whether it's in where you, how you vote or what you do if your daughter is, gets pregnant out of wedlock or what you do if uh, uh, anybody else in the community gets pregnant out of wedlock. What do you do? What do you suggest? Uh, some people say, well, you, you don't have any right to suggest anything. Well, that depends on whether you, whether you are... Uh, under compulsion by your understanding of the Christian faith to protect people and to help people and to show love to people. That, that love might show it. Uh, some Christians may differ on how to show love to a person in that situation. But a Christian cannot be a Christian and take ethics seriously without having some concern about that. So Bard accounts begin, Bard account. Bart's account begins from the assertion that it is only in the concept of covenant that the concept of God can itself find completion. Why? Because God is not known and is not knowable except in Jesus Christ. Now, that's a Christian statement. Now, I'm going to have to spend some time talking about this, and I talk about it a little bit every time this kind of thing comes up. Because... Uh, the assertion on the part of Christians that salvation is only in the name of Jesus Christ is sometimes badly misunderstood by some people. It's sometimes badly misunderstood, in my opinion, by some Christian people. But it's, it's especially badly misunderstood by a lot of non-Christian people, such as Jews and, and uh, secular people. Uh, because... Uh, that is, that is looked upon as a kind of a hyper-bigoted sectarian statement. For instance, uh, I may or may not think very much of the nomination of Ashcroft as Attorney General. But one way in which he has been entirely misunderstood is that he made a speech before a group of Christians in which he said, Jesus is king. You know, uh, what does that mean? We can't have anybody in, in office who believes that Jesus is king. Well, then you can't have any president we've ever had because almost all the presidents we've ever had believed that Jesus was king. That doesn't mean that they go around trying to make everybody into Christian. Uh, and their views of Jesus as king may have been liberal or they may have been conservative or they may have been neo-orthodox or anything in between. But as, as uh, horrible as Clinton lived his life, he believed Jesus was king. He just didn't live his life in relationship to it. Gore believed that Jesus was king. Bush believed that Jesus is king. So you didn't have a choice in the, uh, in the uh, election between someone who believed that Jesus was king and somebody who didn't. So you need to try to understand what a person means when they say that. They don't mean that that Americans all have to be Christians. They're making a faith statement about themselves. And, uh, and uh, they may have a tendency to want to tell the story of Christianity. For instance, Jimmy Carter taught Sunday school every Sunday while he was in the presidency. Uh, 
Ronald Reagan, who was considered to be an ultra-right Christian, never went to church when he was, in, when he was the president. But here's Jimmy Carter, who's considered kind of to be a liberal, uh, is, is really a, a fairly orthodox Christian. And he um, had Sunday school, taught Sunday school. He still teaches Sunday school. And what he has chosen to do now that he's not president uh, shows that even though for political reasons he did not make a very effective president, and it may have been because he was so in tune with Christian ethics of human rights. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of swing around a little bit to, to keep your office. And uh, so, so it's, that, it's in that sense that somebody who is really committed to a vision of Christian ethics may have a very difficult time being president. He may make promises, for instance, and not keep them after he becomes president because it will, it will be against uh, the interest of some of his financial supporters. Uh, but let me get back to the theological question. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was not saying that the only people who are going to heaven are Christians. He couldn't have been saying that. Why? Because there was nobody, there were no Christians at the time. Wh who was he talking to? He was talking primarily to his disciples, and he was talking to Jews, and all of his disciples were Jews. And what he was saying was, there is no way to get to heaven unless you are related to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus is the incarnation of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he wasn't saying that as soon as he said that, all Jews were going to hell. Or even all Hindus are going to hell. What he's saying is, there is only one God. There are not two. And if that God is represented by Jesus Christ, then it's through Jesus Christ that all people are saved, whether they've ever heard of him or not. Now, take this up in the New Testament, for instance, uh, and that is a Christian affirmation that shouldn't be scary to anybody. Because one of the requirements of a person who believes that salvation is through Jesus Christ is to love and to be tolerant and non-bigoted toward everybody else. That's one of the requirements. But Paul, for instance, is, telling, is explaining in the book of Romans that we are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And what, who is the example that he gives of a person in history who is saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Who's the example he gives? Abraham. Abraham. And that's the reason why Paul lays down little hints throughout his writings. That there is no doubt that at the end of time, uh, every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. And there's, and there's no name given whereby people can be saved except Jesus Christ. But he also says, you Christians are not the judge. Because they're not, people are not saved by being Christians. Paul didn't even call himself a Christian. People are not saved by being Christians. People are saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And if Abraham was saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and then, who never heard the name, then what we're going to have to do is just get, get our hands off. We're going to have to get our hands off of salvation and let God do the saving. So Christians and non-Christians uh, should not judge their... Uh, Non-Christians should not judge their fellow Christians as bigoted just because they affirm this idea any more than a Jew should be considered bigoted by saying there's only one God. If there's only one God, then if you say there's not just one God, you're lying. You, know? you can't be a true Jew if you believe that there's more than one God. You may say things like, uh, that God can be understood in different ways, and there's a possibility that that God can be related to by people who are not Jews. You can make that statement. Because 
even from the Hebrew scripture, God's salvation is not dependent upon your being a Jew or being a Hebrew. But salvation is dependent upon the Jewish God. You understand, understand what I'm saying? So, uh, a Christian, uh, well, some Christians don't do this, but a Christian is certainly not being bigoted or irrational by claiming that the only way to salvation is Jesus Christ, any more than a Jew is irrational by claiming that the only one who can save is, is their God. Because their God is God. If you decide that your God is not God, then you probably ought to quit being a Jew, you know, at least religiously. And if you decide that Jesus Christ is not the way in which God has expressed himself, then uh, th there's not much use in being a Christian. But if you express that, that doesn't mean you're being bigoted or you're judging anybody else. You don't have the right to judge anybody else. When Paul, for instance, went to Athens, he found a group of people who were philosophical theologians. They believed in the gods of the Greeks, or they believed in the god of Plato or the Stoic god or some other god. And Paul went to, went to Athens and he saw this shrine that said on the bottom, to an unknown god. Well, Paul believed that Jesus Christ was the only way. But he didn't go up to those philosophers and say, you stupid idiots, you're worshiping a false god. What did he say? He said, I see that you're very religious people. You're so religious, you have, even have a shrine to an unknown god. I'm glad I saw that because I'm going to tell you who that god is. In other words, if you're a monotheist, you can only believe there's one god. So if somebody is reaching out to God, even if he's a Stoic or a Platonist, he's reaching out to the only one God. And Christians believe that because of the revelation that is in Jesus Christ, Christians can tell the story of that God in a way that will be redemptive. After they told the story, then it's up to God to, uh, to uh, relate to that person. I can't re God can't relate to another person um, directly through me. Anyway, I wanted to just, kind of just get that off my chest because as we go along, you will notice Ramsey and Banner will be very uh, clear on this subject that they're Christians and they believe that Jesus Christ is the one through whom God has revealed himself. But that does not mean that Ramsey believes that everybody who doesn't call themselves Christians are going to hell. That's not what that idea entails. In fact, that is a non-Christian, from Ramsey's perspective, that is a non-Christian position. And if just little things like that would help us get along a little bit better in America and other places, uh, both with our non-Christian friends and with some of our Christian friends, because some of our, especially more fundamentalist Christians, are really uh, piled on by a lot of people because uh, they're not really, some of them are bigots, but most of them are not really bigots in the sense that most people think they are. And that's one of the purposes for, for uh, religious studies, is to help people understand their neighbor. And we are all anxious these days to understand Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. I'm just hoping that we will also get just as excited about understanding our fundamentalist neighbors. Okay, does anybody have a question or a comment? We haven't gotten through all this. The Christian doctrine of God cannot have only God for its content, but since its object is this God, it must also have man, to the extent that in Jesus Christ, man is made a partner in the covenant decreed and founded by God. The covenant or partnership has, however, for the human partner, two aspects the election of humankind and its claiming are in this order, grace and law. We've talked about the word election, how it's badly misunderstood. That's, that's one of my goals in, 
in being a teacher is to try to also help Americans understand their Calvinist and Puritan ancestors because they love, Americans love what the Calvinists and Puritans gave to them, but they badmouth the Calvinists and Puritans all the time because they have a misunderstanding of what they mean by words, like election and so forth. What, they, what the Calvinist means, that, that is a, a theologically respectable Calvinist, what a Calvinist means by election is that God has come down and has chosen to redeem his people. Now, what's wrong with that? And not only that, but people need to act as though they were redeemed. A Calvinist uh, did not, a, a good theological Calvinist did not believe that they could decide and point out who was saved and who wasn't saved. That's a, that's a bad rap for Calvinists. All right, we will continue next time with uh, this introduction.